one of the most powerful trends in the climate story, I think, is climate litigation. Um, and with me here to, to talk about this is the new CEO of, of Client Earth, uh, Laura Clark. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You've been in this job now for two months. Can you just tell us a little bit about your early impressions? Yeah, absolutely. So two months in, um, and as you say, we use, Client Earth use the law to make change. We're here to make change, to tackle climate change, protect nature, stop pollution. And we do that, I think we most get most, if people know us, they know us for the litigation wins mm -hmm. that we have, but we actually do three things. We build capacity, we train prosecutors, you know, work with communities to empower them to look after their environment. We adv advise and advocate for the right legislation in place, and then we do strategic litigation to hold mm -hmm. corporates and governments to account. And it's all about how we can affect that systemic change. Mm. So we bring cases that will then set a precedent and will actually change the way uh, governments, corporates mm. um, operate and the way they think. And could you perhaps give us like a few concrete examples of the kind of work you've done and some of the successes you've had that just sort of give the audience here mm. a sense of the kind of impact that you can have when you're successful? Yeah, absolutely. So we've um, a number of cases, um, particularly we've been very, very focused recently on, or over the last five years, on corporate responsibilities and the climate change space. And so um, looking at, first of all, advising on what, what is a 1.5 degrees aligned yeah. net zero strategy and what that looks like in terms of, you know, really sitting at the heart of a company's operations. But then we hold companies to account when they don't do that. And so we've had a big focus on greenwashing mm -hmm. in recent years with our greenwashing files. And so, for example, in 2019, um, we filed a complaint against uh, BP for its advertising that um, talked all about um, its sustainable future and low carbon future. And when in reality, 96% of its operations is in fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. so, so, and then as a result of that complaint, BP withdrew their advertising and said they would no longer do reputation mm -hmm. type advertising. And we've got a number of other greenwashing cases. And the idea there is to say, you know, we don't want to make the best the enemy of the good. If an organization is genuinely trying to do the right thing, mm -hmm. but just getting a few things wrong, because this is hard, right? Then we're not, we don't want to be suing companies that are trying to do the right thing and just, you know, getting a few things wrong. What we want to do is, is go after companies that are saying they're doing the right thing, but it's actually just a PR exercise mm -hmm. and it's misleading people. And so when you take a greenwashing case like that, it sets an example of a company that's not doing the right thing. It means that others sit up and take notice and change what they do. And, and we hope to ch you know, change the behaviors then of corporates and advertising and, and therefore accelerate uh, the, the transition to net zero. And can you just, you know, w when you're making those mm. cases, like on greenwashing, mm. what sort of legal arguments are you making? Um, yeah. you know, obviously, when you, when, you take, when you hold governments to account, obviously yeah. you're sort of saying you're not doing the right thing by your citizens. Yeah. But when it's companies, can you give us a sense of the, the flavor of the arguments that you use? Yeah, and it depends. Uh, it depends on the jurisdiction where yeah. you're operating, but often through that you'll go through some sort of consumer protection legislation, yeah. and it, so it's about finding the right vehicle for a claim. But as you say, yeah, when we're taking governments to account, so we um, had a uh, win this year against the UK government's net zero strategy, where the High Court ruled on the hottest day of the year, of the hottest day ever in the UK, it ruled that the UK's net zero strategy was not compliant with our 2008 Climate Change Act because essentially the numbers didn't add up. There was a gap in terms of how they were going to get to the required emissions. When you do that sort of litigation, mm. you, you've got a clear vehicle. So our vehicle there was the well, there, there was clear vehicles, but our yeah. vehicle there was the UK Climate Change Act. And, you know, again, that the UK's got a very progressive legislation, a very, very progressive climate change architecture, if you like, and a huge number of people trying to do the right thing. And, and litigation is not always antagonistic, right? It's saying, you know, this is how we think there are gaps and how we can improve what we're trying to do. And a result of that, um, that win in the High Court, the UK government has said it's going to go away and it's going to improve that net zero strategy and it's going to do that by March 23. Mm -hmm. Greenwashing, we've talked about greenwashing, mm -hmm. also um, human rights. I mean, mm -hmm. at this COP, I've particularly noticed just how much talk there is about biodiversity, forests, protecting forests, yeah. et cetera. You've, had, you've been taking some cases recently 
that focus on human rights and, the, and biodiversity. Can you talk a little bit about those? Well, actually, the one that I'm, we're most excited about is human rights and climate change, yeah. actually. So I'll talk about that if I can. And that's um, a very recent, in September, a, a, a decision by the UN Human Rights Council that the Australian government's inaction on climate change was a violation of the rights of the indigenous Torres Strait Islanders. Yeah. Um, and essentially, the Torres Strait Islanders have lived um, where they live on these low-lying islands uh, for, for all time. Um, and, the, and, but, and their complaint was that the Australian government was not doing enough to support them and, and adapt to the climate change impacts of essentially sea level rise. And, and Yessi Mosby, who's one of these Torres Strait Islanders who brought the claim and Client Earth worked with them on it, he's here at COP26 mm -hmm. and we had an event with him yesterday where he was talking about the impact of, of climate change and sea level rise at such a real personal level, whereby one day he was walking along the beach and the bones of his grandmother washed up on the beach because the, the sea has risen to a level where it's encroaching on the land, it's washing away graves. And particularly in Torres Strait Islander culture, you know, that is the most devastating thing because when someone passes, they, you, know, you, you bury them and they need to stay undisturbed um, and I think what was what was extraordinary and so moving about you know him talking about it is it really brings it home this is the real life experience of so many people around the world who are dealing with these impacts and when we can then get a case that says you know that actually indigenous people's culture is at risk from climate change but also that governments have got a duty to their people to support them in um, in in dealing with the impacts of climate change that's really powerful and it's really powerful also in the context of the conversation of loss and damage. Uh, and because the, the Human Rights Council also ruled that the Australian government needed to pay compensation. So, so we're, we're proud of that. It's, it's one of a great number mm. of human rights and climate-focused pieces of litigation that, are on, that have been going on for a while. Um, and we've got a number of cases uh, that we're working through at the European Court of Human Rights, really trying to embed that idea of a right to a healthy environment, but I think they're only going to increase. I think that climate vulnerable populations are going to be bringing more cases. I think we'll have lots with a kind of loss and damage element to them, um, and uh, um, and it won't and it won't of course just be indigenous peoples. Any people for whom you know their government actually has a duty yeah. of responsibility to look after them. On that subject, you know, obvi obviously this is a global. You know, the rights of indigenous people mm. and their, their plight as a global story. In which countries do you see, obviously a lot of your work depends on the legal system, on, mm. the, on the country where you're taking the case. Where do you see sort of the most um, promising avenues uh, for taking on those cases and which are the, which are the countries where it's, you think it's going to be harder? Oh, that's interesting. So obviously, you've had success yeah. in Australia, but I'm, as you're yeah. talking, I'm thinking Indonesia, I'm thinking Brazil, yeah. I'm thinking Mexico. Yeah. So I think there's there's all it, it really depends also on you know where we're operating and and what the best way is for us to to, to work in that place. Yeah. So in some in some jurisdictions it works for us as client earth to work with um, people in local communities to take cases and so we often want to work with citizens. So when we do clean air cases, we work on behalf of citizens who are suffering from air pollution. In in some places it's not really litigation is not the right approach mm -hmm. for us and we do much better. So in China for example we do really good work training of training prosecutors, making sure they've got the right legislation legislation in place so that they have their own field there of, of climate litigation. Um, and in, in West Africa, we are working with communities, um, supporting them to develop their own approaches for forest conservation, yeah. for example. So I think it's different vehicles in different places, but I think it's quite interesting to look at how international law is being used. So in the UN Human Rights Council, you know, what is the, you know, how can we best use international law in some of these cases and in a way that then makes governments around the world sit mm -hmm. up and take notice and think about the reputational risk and also their, their obligations and legal duties. Uh, and then looking at um, regional human rights bodies. So the European Court of Human Rights um, is, is, is very 
very important, but there are others as well, the Inter-American Human Rights Commission and yep. so on. There was a very, very pivotal case, the Inuit uh, claim in 2005 that actually was dismissed because it was kind of ahead of its time. But anyone who works on these um, human rights cases, they kind of refer to the arguments mm. made there. But I think it's, again, I think that that power of international law is, is really important and, you know, ideally, every country would have brought its international climate change commitments into domestic legislation and then you would have a vehicle as we do in the yeah. UK, but of course that's still the minority of countries. Yeah. yeah. So we've talked about human rights, um, we've talked about um, greenwashing, of course, climate earth in many ways made its name by taking governments, by taking mm. governments uh, to court. Can you t talk to us a little bit about some of the interesting cases that you have ahead of you when it, when it comes to governments? I mean, you very successfully uh, argued against the UK earlier this year. Yeah. yeah, so we've got a number of cases ongoing supporting citizens on clean yeah. air across, and we're trying to, you know, we always try and, you know, make it a sort of systemic approach. So with um, saying that actually governments have got an obligation to ensure clean air, because it's something like 93%, it is, I know it's 93% of children around the world breathe air that is of a potential risk to their health and development. And so that's a very, very big focus yeah. um, for us. Um, and um, and so I think, but then we will have other cases. Sometimes, of course, it's a bit tricky to talk about what we have coming up because yes, of course, of you course, know yeah. it takes a while before yeah. they they launch. But um, but just looking looking across the waterfront, and the trick, of course, is working out where we can have the best impact because you know you really need to spot you know where are the areas where a, an illegal intervention here can really tip things over and so we work closely with a whole lot of other organizations who are really good at doing the analysis of that sort of thing you know mapping where the issues are where progress isn't going fast enough and then thinking about the the theory of change there and a, and a big focus at the moment for us and this is coming back to the corporate side is on the on the um, theory of change, thinking about the responsibilities and personal responsibilities of directors. Um, and, you know, that sense that actually if you can really get the sense of an individual being liable, that's quite powerful rather yeah. than a sort of rather more anonymous corporate. Um, and so we've done a couple of shareholder action cases, which are really interesting. So our, our a, a big, really quite significant one was a, a couple of years back against um, Enea, which is a Polish energy company, and they were planning to build a great big new coal-fired power station. We, we, we took a case as shareholders, having some shares in Enea, we said, we don't think this is a good investment decision for the company. We think that the coal-fired power station will end up being a stranded asset. Um, and the court agreed, and the um, uh, coal-fired power station didn't go ahead. And on that very same day, the markets agreed as well because the share price increased by 4%. And so, you know, doing that, you know, very much saying this is what we are arguing is in the interests of you as a company in terms of your long-term sustainability and us as shareholders, that's quite powerful. And we've got another case um, that's starting now, which is again a shareholder action case against Shell. And we're arguing that Shell's um, lack of a meaningful climate transition plan, climate mitigation plan, is a breach of the director's fiduciary duties under the UK Companies Act 2008. Uh, because they are, again, you know, they're thinking about the short-term returns for shareholders, but not thinking about long-term longevity. And so that's quite an exciting case, focused very much on the responsibility of those board of directors. And I think that that focus on fiduciary duty is, is, is going to be an increasing vehicle for, yeah. for litigation around the world. So you've talked about the cases that you're excited mm. about, where you've had success. Where are you frustrated? Are there particular areas of climate litigation where it's just, it's just proving really difficult? Not just maybe yeah. for Planet Earth, but for yeah. some of your other organizations such as yours. What are the tough nuts to crack here? Oh, it's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure, <laughs> two months in, I'm not sure yeah. what I've got enough of a sense of what's frustrating. What I do know is the areas that are a bit more uncharted territory right. and where I think we want to be doing a lot more and you know and that's a lot on the on the biodiversity side but also looking across at supply chains looking at food systems mm -hmm. is so important and finding the right vehicles there so that you can look and see you know what's happening with big agri 
agribusinesses, what, are, what is their responsibility in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions, but also deforestation. So that's an area that I think is a massive growth area, looking across and looking at, looking in a systemic way at supply chains, corporate due diligence, that is not just about a company's operation right here, but across its entire supply chain yeah. and all its emissions. Yeah. yeah. And I presume, presumably on biodiversity, you have the same challenge that lots of other people here at COP have. You know, when you look at emissions, mm -hmm. you can, it's easy to quantify it. There's a, there's a vast corpus of data that you can hang your hat on. Yeah. But in the biodiversity, it's just much harder. It's to much get your harder. It's much harder because you it. can, yeah. you know, you've got carbon tonnage, right? And you haven't yeah. got the same thing on biodiversity. But we have established lots of the tools. So, like the task force on climate related financial risk disclosures, you know, if you can adapt that sort of thing and apply it to nature, we need to do it. I mean, the, the report uh, just a couple of months ago from WWF that said that 70% of our biodiversity has, uh, we've lost 70% of our biodiversity. Mm in the last 50 years, it's really urgent. And I think, in a way, we sort of, the sort of COP and CBD different events mean that you, we kind of think we've just got to talk about climate when we're at right. COP. You can't separate them out, right? It's all part of the... It's all part of the same problem. And often, when we take a case, it will be getting at both biodiversity and nature issues, but also, of course, climate, particularly when you're talking about deforestation. That, that you know speaks to everything yeah. and community rights as well. Yeah. I think at this point we're happy to take questions from the audience. Meg has, Meg has been collating questions. Do, do we have anything? Oh, no questions. No questions have been sent in yet. Um, what what is it I wanted to talk to you about also? I mean, we've talked about the UK, mm. Europe, Australia. The US always seems like it's a jurisdiction where we're all, we're constantly waiting for something big to happen, but it doesn't quite happen. Is, it, is the US a, a, an area in which you're doing a lot of work, or...? We're just, we're, we're just starting up in the US, actually. Yeah. Rather, we've been there for a while, but very much focused on our, on our development fundraising right. activity, and we've got lots and lots of great supporters in the US. But we've just launched our first um, case in the US, which is a greenwashing case against a gas company. Um, and we're, our focus there is very much on the corporate sector, because the corporate sector, you know, if you're thinking about how do you change things, you know, you've got to, you've got to actually ch turn the juggernaut that is that is fine that is investment finance business yeah. to be net zero aligned and you know and for us the best way that we do that is through the fiduciary duties through the responsibilities of companies and so um, we're you know we've got a very sort of working on you know in Delaware where lo lots of these companies are listed looking at their fiduciary duties what are the actual legal responsibilities of directors for climate and working that out and then sort of mapping that across to mm -hmm. um, to companies that we can you know I suppose make an example of. Mm. You mentioned BP on the greenwashing front. BP, mm. can you talk, mention some of the other companies you're yeah, looking at? Yeah, so we've got one against um, Total Energies in France that we're doing with some other partners in France. Uh, we have one against Glencore in Australia, mm -hmm. which um, is investing in new coal while all the time saying that it is doing the right thing in climate terms. Those two things don't add up. Um, and that's listed in London, so there are sort of, you know, the implications there and sort of levers there that we can use. And we've got a very interesting one against the airline KLM, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially, you know, uh, uh, under Dutch uh, consumer protection laws that says that, that KLM's advertising, which is all about sustainable aviation, is misleading consumers because it's saying, you know, it's implying that we're basically very much on the brink or almost there already in having sustainable aviation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's going to encourage more people to fly. We know that Flying is not sustainable, um, and so that's that's an interesting mm. case as well. That's and so why why I mean presumably you could make that argument about a lot of airlines. Mm. Why KLM in particular? Is it just because it's because their advertising is so focused on this aspect, yeah. um, and you know, and it's really making a really big play about everything that it's doing on the sustainability side. And when you look at um, the development in sustainable aviation fuel, we are a very very long way from right. that being a reality. Um, and you know that you, certainly you've got for short hop flights you can do electric, but you know in terms of your norm, normal length of flying, the normal size aeroplanes, and I'm not 
an expert on types of aeroplane, mm. but you know, you just we're a long way from electric, you know, electric or hydrogen working yep. there, and we're a long way from sustainable aviation fuel being mainstream. Yeah. Mm. Nora, thank you so much for joining us Pleasure. this morning. We are out of time, um, unfortunately, but thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you.